Welcome to Time for Healing. I'm your host, Marion Porter of Star Winds. Today, I'm so excited to say, is our special one hour show featuring the wonderful Amantha Murphy, who's going to tell us all about the way of the Siobhan. Oh, Amantha Murphy, you're on my show. <laughs> yes, I am. Thank you, Marion, for asking me. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. So, um, the way of the Siobhan, what, uh, what is this? Well, the word Siobhan means the yes woman, and it also means the keeper of the mysteries in the Irish. Sha being yes, the yes, and van, van is woman the woman. So the way of the Siobhan is a blending of ancient Irish mysteries, traditions, teachings, and women's mysteries, rituals, and rites of passage. Wow. So what are some of these mysteries and rites of passages? What's involved in uh, the study of all of this? Sure. So should I just give you a little background into that first? Yeah. How I got into it and how oh, I call yeah. myself that. Fantastic. Yeah, so I uh, spent all my summers with my grandmother on the land where I live now in Kerry um, in Ireland and my parents left Ireland after the Second World War to find jobs in the UK because there was no work at that time in Ireland and so I was born in a place called Kilburn in London which is a very strong Irish community and from my earliest memories we came back to Ireland every year for holidays and my brother and I would come and spend the summer with my granny we'd come back with the first relatives and go back with the last and my granny was the local midwife and healer in the area where we lived she was four foot two so she was a tiny little thing and we had no running water and um, we didn't have electricity in the beginning either so we would have water from the spring we'd go with the buckets and we'd have rainwater and we cooked over the fire and she would see people out as well as bringing babies into the world. See people out? See people out. It's what I call soul midwifery. She'd be with people as they're passing from this realm into the next. Wow. So one of the things she did was she would take me out and talk to me about the fairy folk and we would go and visit the fairy folk. And she showed me how to attune with the stone people, how to connect with the tree brethren and how to ask to have the stories shared with me. And I would lie on the earth where I live now and I would come back every year and I would lie there and I would wait. And gradually I would become that living earth. And then this energy would come to me that I always called her or she. I saw her as my mother and she was this old, old woman and she would talk to me. And every year when I would come home, she would share things with me and tell me things. and. For me, that was the real world. I grew up talking to spirit from oh. my earliest age. I was, I was wondering, there's yes. a, talking, to, talking to spirit. Talking to spirit. Spirit was the real world for me growing up. I'm oh. dyslexic and in those days they didn't know about dyslexia. I was born with double vision, so I'd see two of everything. And of course now I know what that meant. But at the time, this world, this reality was like a dream world place I had to pretend to fit into and my real world was the place of spirit and it also became the place of the fairies and the stone people and that to me was the real world that to me was my reality that's beautiful <laughs> it's beautiful and it was looking back it was lonely you know it was a you know this is the place I lived myself but I didn't mm. really have deep connections with anybody in this realm except for my family of course oh. so yeah, it was, uh, looking back, it must have been lonely, but at the time I was happy. But you learned a lot of cool things. Like Huge what, things. What, what, what was it like to talk to the stone people, the fairy folk? What was, well, what was that for like? us, the stone people are our original uh, people in Ireland. You know, Ireland was once a land of trees and stones. So they're the story keepers. They're like the bones in our body. They hold the stories. That's beautiful. And so when you connect with the stone people and you ask permission to see the stories, sometimes they show you the story. So you see it from the very beginning of what's happening around them and the different peoples and the different things that happen. And then other times, sometimes it's a bit like a rewind button 
on the video machine. Sometimes you see the time and space now, and then it starts going back. So you could go back 100 years, 400 years, for another 300, and it keeps going back in time. So you never know which way they're going to share it with you, which way they're going to show it to you. So stones are recording all of... All the stories, the stories of the land. Yeah, they're the bones. Is this why I love like just touching stones yeah. and even like I can't even walk anywhere without picking up a stone or two. Yeah. Love to lean against massive stones. Yeah. <gasps> yeah. And sometimes if they let you, you can see their faces in the stones. And if they show you their faces, then you know that they really want to share with you. Yeah. And sometimes they want to journey with you. They might want to journey with you for a few days, months, or even years. They might want to stay with you. Other times they want you to take them to another place. So you are connecting one place, one space with another through the stones. That's the coolest thing in the world. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So they've told you a lot of different stories? They have. Can you they tell have. us one? Oh, well, um, for example, when I, many years ago, many years ago, I was um, drawn to go to a place in the middle of Ireland. It's called Ishnuk. At the time, I didn't know what it was called. I just knew that I was being called there. And in my growing up years, the subject I was good at was mathematics. Oh. I couldn't read properly, I couldn't write, I couldn't spell, but maths was very, very easy to me. So when I was called to go to the centre of Ireland, of course, didn't I sit down and work it out latitude and longitude wise, and took myself off there with a friend. And we found the place and we, what, we climbed up the hill. It was all private property, so of course, being you know, very typically Celtic, we climbed over and went off anyway. And we climbed up and we found this amazing stone called the Cat Stone. And I put my hands on the stone, and as soon as I put my hands on the stone, I was plugged in. Oh, I was wow. just completely plugged into the earth. And I saw her, I saw this old woman that used to talk to me, the Shanvan, the old woman. I saw her there and she started giving me the story of this land, this place, and how all the tribes would gather here every year at the time of Bieltana and how they would have a great fire and how deals would be done. And when the deals were done, they would use this type of a, an instrument to go under this stone and they would sound through it. And as they were sharing this, I heard the sound and the whole of the land vibrated with the sound. So the person that was with me felt it as well. And she was actually writing down what I was saying because I don't retain what is being shared with me. So I'm talking and my friend's writing it down, actually on toilet roll, because that's all we had carried with us. Uh -huh. And um, <laughs> so she's writing it all down and it's raining and I'm crying because to suddenly come to the place of this old woman that I had communed with for all of my life, um, the reality of it was, was overpowering, you know, overwhelming. So I'm telling the story of the place and how this was the place that the tribes would come from the four corners of our land at Bielton, how the great fires would be lit and how runners would take fires across the land. And so afterwards, we did what every good Irish woman or man would do. We went to the pub. Of course. To dry out and to have a hot toddy. <laughs> so we were sitting with our hot toddy in this little pub nearby. And there were some old men sitting at the bar. And we started talking to them. And they started telling us the story of this place. Oh. And of course, 85%, 87% of what I had received was what they had been telling us. Really? Which is lovely. So I used to do something called psychic archaeology. What's that? Which is when you go to a site and you ask permission of the stones to actually see what went on there, what they use this area for. Ireland has over 85, sorry, 65 percent of all of Europe's megalithic sites. And so we have a lot like of stone ancient places. And stuff? Yeah, cairns, uh, stone circles, megalithic tombs. We have over 65% of all of Europe. So we wow. have a lot on our tiny little island. And they all have stories to share. Why so much up in Ireland? I believe it's because the people, every new people that came to Ireland, whether it was the Nemods, the Fearbogs, the Tuatha the Celts, every new people that came to Ireland saw and felt the power of these places and rather than disturb them and suffer consequently because of that they took on the energy of these places and if they didn't use them themselves they left them alone 
there's a very strong tradition in Ireland of fairy forts. Fairy forts? And if every family will be able to tell you stories about fairy forts and what happened to this first person or what happened to that family if they actually went through it or if they pulled it down. What is a fairy fort? So there are different types of fairy forts. A lot of the older Irish people would see a lot of the megalithic sites as fairy forts. Um, the younger people will recognize fairy forts would be more of a glen mm -hmm. or a cooping of trees together, even a place where perhaps uh, flowers grow and mushrooms around them. Oh, wow. So everybody knows where the fairy forts are and people don't touch them. They leave them alone. And quite often you'll find a lot of hawthorn trees growing around them. Hawthorn trees are the trees of the fairies. Really? So we don't cut them down, um, we don't bring them into the house because you will upset the fairy folk. The really, you know, the tradition in Ireland very strongly is we believe betwixt and between. We believe there's as much in the unseen world as there is in the seen. So we're not talking like Tinkerbell uh, Disney fairies here, no. are we? No, we're talking of different fairies. You can have the flower fairies, the tree fairies, you can have the leprechauns. And leprechauns. The leprechauns do not like to be disturbed. The leprechauns would be more like you'd see as dwarfs. Mm. And in our stories, when the Tua de Danon had to do battle with the first Celts, the militians that came across from Spain, and they fought, it said, for three days and for three nights. So much so that the, the world was filled with fire. They were using great magic and fire to fight each other that people thought the world was on fire. Oh and when the Celts actually did take over, they took the Tuatha Dé Danann, who to them looked like small children, um, up to Ushnuk to decide what to do with them. And they said to them, because you believe that your souls are part of this living earth, because you believe that you are part of this land, you must wear green and you must go and live in the valleys, and you must go and live in the dales, and you must go and live beside the streams, you must go and live in the caves. And it's said that the Tuatha had magic in their music, that mm. they could make you laugh, could make you cry, or could make you sleep. And wow. so that's where we get the story of the leprechauns and their music from. I never knew. Oh yeah, the wearing of the green and the music, yeah. The wearing of the green. So it has nothing to do with St. Patrick's Day no, then? No, nothing at all. <laughs> Can we talk about St. Patrick's Day? If we that? have to, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, no, we're not talking about St. Patrick's Day. I don't want to get off on that tangent. Okay. Too many people around here yeah, are Yeah, yeah, and it's too many people on one side or the other. About, about their holidays. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so no. coming back to the tour day. Yes. Let's come back to the story of, the, of Ireland. So um, when I was growing up, I, and to this day I still don't learn from books, but share a story with me and I will carry that story. I will remember that story. So I grew up with the stories. Okay. I grew up with my granny and her cronies sitting around the fire in the evening telling stories with their little glasses of hot toddy, a little drop of pachine or whiskey, a big spoon of honey and boiled water. Wow. And so they'd sit around the fire and they'd tell their stories. And so one of the stories was the stories of our land because Ireland is an old tradition. So they would tell the stories, and in the stories, Ireland was once a land of trees and stones oh. for hundreds of thousands of years, until they heard whispers, whispers through the roots of the trees of these two leggeds that walked upon the land. And so they decided to fashion a two-legged for themselves. So they fashioned a type of being that only had one eye, and could stand still and become like a stone, or their feet would move way down through the earth and draw nourishment from the earth like the trees. And these were called the formions. Formions? Formions. And so then we had the coming of the first people as we know it. And this was Caesar. And Caesar, it said, was the niece of Noah. Noah so, of, Noah's of the ark. ark. That's right. Really? And so, of course, we know that the actual story of the ark or the actual story of the flood was thousands of years before they say it in the Bible. Hmm. So, Caesar was beloved by her uncle Noah and he warned her of the flood. And it said that she came to Ireland in a ship with 53 women and two men. And one of the men died and the other one, Finton, ran away 
for fear of being with 53 women. <laughs> <laughs> so they all died out. And then we had the coming of the Nemods. And the Nemods we know very little about, except that they were the builders of our megalithic sites. They came in from the west, which has now been proved. So they came in from the west, not from the east, not from Europe, but they came in from the other side, from the west. They arrived in Sligo and they began to build. And they started in Sligo and they moved across from Sligo to Carrakeel, across from there to Loch Crewe, to what is called Brunaboyne. And Brunaboyne is the oldest engineered buildings in the world. 500 really? years older than the Great Pyramids. And to this day, they cannot tell you how they built them, how they moved these huge stones, how they made these perfect drawings, these Neolithic symbols on the stones, and what they actually mean, because we don't have a Rosetta Stone for them. So it's really open to your own interpretation. Wow. Yeah, so then after the Nemods, and very little is known of them, except that they were the builders of these great sites. Mathematicians, engineers, absolutely. And then we had what was called the Fearbolgs. And the Fearbolg, the word Fearbolg means short, dark creature, swathy creature. Oh. And it also means bagmen. Bagmen? Bagmen, because the Fearbolgs, it said, were the first exporters in Ireland. Oh. Ireland has never had snakes. Snakes can't shed their skin in Ireland because of the makeup of the earth. And so Ireland has never had snakes. Really? So the Fearbolgs would export sods of turf, of, of uh, peat and earth to ancient Greece. And the ancient Greeks believed that if they put this around their houses, it would stop the snakes from coming into their houses. Why have I never heard this before? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. And so the Fearbolgs lived there for a long time. <clears throat> and they had a great queen, a goddess, who was Chieltu. And Chieltu, it said, brought agriculture to Ireland. So our stories tell us of the timings of these oh. things. So she brought agriculture. So we're moving from the hunter into the agriculturalist. Oh. And it said that she cleared the plains of Ireland, bringing the agriculture. And they lived in a place called Tara. It's now called Tara, which is the royal residence in Ireland. Wow. And Tara, they would, they would have great assemblies there, great assemblies. And then we had the coming of the Tuatha Dé And it's said that the Tuatha Dé came on boats of light that floated above the water. That sounds like space aliens. <laughs> Could be. Could be. Cool. Uh, my sense, my journeying on that is that they came from Lemuria. <gasps> oh, <coughs> mm. that's fascinating. So they came over the water. They landed down in the south of Ireland and they sent Nuda, their greatest warrior, out onto the land to see if they could come onto this land, if they could live upon the land. And it's said that he met Balor upon the plains and Balor was the great warrior of the Fearbolgs and evening was coming and it was an unwritten law that no man may fight when the sun is not high in the sky. So the two of them sat around the fire and they talked into the night. And the next day Balor went back to his people and Nuda went back to his people and Nuda said to his people, you know, these people are good people. They're a strong people. They too worship the land as their great mother. And Balor went back to his people and he said, you know, these are a great people. They're kind people. They have great magic. And they too worship the earth as their great mother and their weaponry. He has a sword as light as a feather, yet when he lifts it, it carries the flame of the sun within it. And Nuda said to his people, their weaponry. This man had a club as heavy as the biggest rock, and yet he lifted it as if it was nothing at all. And so we know from that, that this is the beginning of the Bronze Age. Wow. So the stories tell us this. So at, they agreed to allow the Tour de Danon to come and to live on the land. And for many, many years, they lived in peace. It was just later, unfortunately, that one of the Fearbolg kings got quite jealous of the Tour de. 
So the two Ledanin came onto the land, and they had their great father god, who was the Dagda, and their mother goddess, which was Anu. And before that, Anu was called Anna, A-N-A, -A, Anna. And so they brought their great gods and goddesses, and they all had great magic. So Dean Kerik was the great herbalist, Ogma, he brought the Ohm language to us and education. And many of the goddesses were great earth goddesses and held the land, held the land in sacredness. Wow. And then we had the coming of the Celts, as I said. So the Celts were traveling through Europe. They came into Europe, up through Siberia, down from Siberia, in through uh, Germany and Switzerland, down into Spain. And the first tribe of Celts that got there were called the Militians. Militians? Militians. Like soldiers? Militians, that was their name, oh. the Militians. And so when they got to Spain, it said from a very high tower, they could see this outline of the land. And when they looked out onto that land, they were desirous to get there. There had been stories about this land of math and magic, uh, ma myth and magic. Wow. This land that was the land of apples and they wanted to get there. So they asked their father if they could go and take this land. For that's what they did. They came and they took, they fought. And so the king said, I want each of you to build a ship, for I want to lose not all of my sons, but build a ship each, for he had seven sons. And so each of them built a ship and traveled out towards Ireland. And it said they landed first in Waterford the southeast coast and they came onto the land and the two day Danon had never seen people like them. They were very big, very hairy, very smelly oh. and the Celts had never seen anything like the two day Danon. They were very small, very light and when they moved it was like they disappeared and reappeared somewhere else. And so the Celts said to them, we've come to take your land. You will now work for us and you will be our servants and our slaves. And the two Dan and talked among themselves and they said, would you go back out over the ninth wave and let us prepare for your coming? We don't need to, said the Celts. Sure, we're here now. Why do we need to go out? Oh, let us prepare. Let us make a great feast for you. Let us hold this space for you. And the Celts thought, well, why not? Look at these little things. They're like children. Sure, we could take them any time. So the Celts all went back into their ships and the seven ships went out over the ninth wave. And as soon as they went out over the ninth wave, a guise was put around the land of Ireland by the two a day. A guise is like a, an energy field put around the land of Ireland. And the Celts found they couldn't get through. They couldn't break through this energy field. So they had two people that were well versed in magic with them. They had Armagan who was the elder brother, and he was also the advisor to their father, the king. And they had Scotia. Scotia was an, uh, an Egyptian princess, married to another of the sons, and well versed in magic. And so Scotia and Armagan began to use fire and throw fire to break through this energy field. And as they did this, they began to move around the very south of Ireland, up onto the lower left there, the south, southwest. And they fought, as I said earlier, for three days and for three nights. And on the end of the third day, they began to break through the guise. Mm. And Armagan landed in Waterville and Scotia landed in Tralee Bay. And Armagan went up and he found a very ancient stone circle there. And he stood in the stone circle, Ectacar, and he began to intone the land unto himself. He called upon the salmon, he called upon the deer, he calls upon the birds, he called upon the earth herself. And as he did, the Tuilidanon began to lose their battle. Oh. And he began to weave the earth unto himself. And it's said that behind him, his wife Shgaina landed and she walked up the hill towards him. But as she did, she fell down dead for the land wasn't ready yet to receive another female deity. And from where she fell, a little stream arose, and that stream became a river. And that river went all the way in to Kinmare. And today that's called the Seen River, 
and seen in Irish is Skena. Oh, wow. So it's called after Armagan's wife. And so they eventually took the land and their father came and two of his sons had died and he was very upset. And he took the people of the two a day and the three princesses, Eru, Fola and Bamva. And they went up and they sat at Ishnuk, the very center of Ireland. And it said that Bamva and Fola asked for their lives and Eru asked for the lives of her people. And so the king decreed that the land would be called after each of them, but they would hold the name Eru. Oh. And so for a while the land was called Bamva, and then it was called Fola. And then when we got our freedom, less than a hundred years ago, De Valera stood on Ishnuk, lifting the flag and declared Ireland Era in honor of Eru, the third princess. Wow. I know. So, yeah. so these aren't just folk tales. This is actual no. real history. This, yeah. Well, the line between mythology and his story, because history is his story. History is the story of the conquerors. And it's his story. Ah. Oh, I get it. Yes. Hey. Wow. Yeah. Story. His, his story. story. Well, yeah. So the line between myth and the story in Ireland, the recorded story, is changing right now because they are now being able to prove a lot of the stories in our oral tradition. And for the Irish, it's always been very, very important to share our stories. Wow. Get a few Irish people around together and within long they're telling stories. So the stories have always been very important. They're part of our roots. They're part of what holds us into the land and in through the land. Yeah. Well, you sure do know a lot of stories. <laughs> the stories feed me. Yeah. And I live in them. So when I tell the stories, I'm there. I see them, I feel them, I taste them. Mm. Hmm. So the Siobhan. Yes. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yes. Siobhan. Um, this is a spirit that everybody can see or is it just a spirit that you can see the shivan yeah. is the energy of the balancing of the stories and the um, tr traditions that the ancient people would have followed so it's a very shamanic tradition ah i wouldn't necessarily claim the word but it's a very shamanic tradition in that we have lower world middle world and upper world in our tradition and you'll often see stylized drawings of celtic trees yeah. and when you do you see the branches going up and down and you see the roots going down and around and the branches and the roots almost touch but they don't because we recognize the richness of our roots. We recognize our roots are our ancestors and we wouldn't be here if they hadn't survived. And so when you look at a tree as high and as wide as the branches are as low and deep and wide, the roots, but many people don't think about the roots. They don't remember the roots. And yet without the roots, the tree could not grow. Without the roots, the tree would not grow and, and feed itself and flower and give fruit and the flowering and the fruit are actually influenced by the roots and what the roots draw upon in the ground and so we know that we are like that ourselves we're like the tree beings we have roots and we have roots that feed us roots that support us roots that hold us and some roots that take from us drain us and these roots are our ancestors and so in those roots are our patterns, all that we carry in honor of the ancestors, not just in our build and our coloring, but also certain patterns that come through families time and again. Can those patterns be healed? Absolutely. A lot of those patterns are patterns we actually want to cultivate. They're patterns that give us strength, tenacity, the ability to survive, because we would not be here if our ancestors hadn't survived. And so we can draw upon that. And then we can become aware of the patterns that no longer serve us. And with love, we can release those patterns. And when we release those patterns, it's like releasing vines wrapped around one of those roots. 
And when we release that, we release that not just for ourselves, but we release it for all of those of our bloodline. So our brothers, our sisters, our cousins, our children, we release that pattern. So it no longer has to go down through the ancestry. Wow. And recognize also that we are tomorrow's ancestors. So what are the patterns we want to cultivate that we can leave here for those of our bloodline? We are tomorrow's ancestors. Yeah. Wow. That's, yeah. that's something to think about. Yeah, yeah. And so that's our lower world. And we call that our place of power. Because when you know what you're carrying, whether you've dealt with it or not, when you know what you carry, when you are in honor of what you carry, that gives you power. It gives you power because you know yourself. So if somebody else is trying to project something onto you, you can see, is that mine? If you know what you carry, then it gives you the power to recognize, no, that is not mine, or yes, I must own this. And so that's our place of power, our lower world. And then our middle world, which is the same as the trunk of the tree, our middle world is our place of being. It's this reality. It's how we live in this reality, how we operate in this reality. And I actually mean live rather than observe oh. or pass by. That Actually, we eat and we drink of this life. We become very aware and conscious of the life around us and our participation within it. And in that participation, we have responsibility. We have responsibility to live this life in the fullest way that we can and to connect with all of life, all of nature and everything around us. So this is our place of being. And you know how a lot of, uh, you'll see a lot of the bark as it grows on, it gets lines and it gets yeah. little bulbs, just like we do, just like we do. Wow. You know, so we are like the bark of the tree there. And then of course you have the branches of the tree, which is what we call the upper world. And the branches of the tree are our spirit connections, our connections to our spirit friends, to our angelics, to what we can call our spirit guides, some would call doorkeepers or gatekeepers. Oh. So that's our place there of spirit, connection to the spirit realm. But unless we have those deep, deep roots down in the earth, holding us, supporting us, unless we are held congruently in our place of being, going up into the spirit realm can actually make us lose our connection through the earth. Because if we don't have the roots, what holds us? Nothing. What supports us? How do we manifest our reality? You cannot manifest your reality if your roots are not deep and strong. If your place of being is not held. And so there's the balance between those three realms. And so we work on that. And it's the way of the Shevan. We always begin with our lower world recognizing and honoring our ancestors and honoring what we as souls have chosen to take on for that family we've come into because we choose the family that we come into and so we honor that we honor what we've taken on from that family from that ancestry and how we me how way how may we actually work through that release that and open that and then we move into the middle world and in the middle world we have what's called the celtic wheel which is our way of living through the wheel a spiral path we're born at some point upon the wheel and we journey upon the wheel in a spiral way and also we have our rituals and our rites of passage and our rites of passage are pivotal times in our life pivotal times where we need to recognize this as a time of sacredness, a time of shifting, a time of change. And we have certain uh, rites of passage that everybody knows about. Birth, naming, for a woman first blood, uh, first love, marriage, bearing children, separation, mm. last blood, death. We know these ones and these are honored in many traditions. And then we have other rites of passage within that, other times that are important to us that we can do a ritual around or a ceremony. And the difference between a ritual and a ceremony, a ritual is something you can do on your own or with one or two. Oh. And a ceremony is normally a group, a community sharing in that ceremony. So for example, uh, marriage, hand fasting, 
would normally be a ceremony because you would have the tribes, the two tribes. And the tradition of the hand fasting was that by the two people coming together and their hands being fasted, tied together, you're also bringing together two tribes oh. in peace and in harmony. And of course, death is a ritual for the person, but it's actually a ceremony for the community because the community come together mm. when someone passes. In Ireland, we love funerals. I mean, we do come out in droves to funerals, you know. We really honor the dead. And, um, and of course, many people have a wake, which is great, you know. Um, and then we honor that a year later as well. And uh, the tradition in Ireland was that when a person died, then their family would mourn for a year and a day. Oh. And at the end of the year and a day, they would do a tradition, a ritual or a ceremony. And in the Catholic tradition, it would be a mass to honor that person. So when my father died, for example, after the year and a day, his brothers came and all put on his suits, which was very lucky that they were of similar size. <laughs> and uh, they wore the suits to the mass and then afterwards traditionally you'd burn the person's clothes but my mother being a very pragmatic woman those clothes went to a second-hand shop they didn't get burnt at all um, so yes yeah, so the rituals the ceremonies that we have help us to recognize these tra transitional points in our life and not just recognize them but really honor our own growth within it and by honoring that we are taking on all that we are we're not putting it to one side, but we're embracing it. Because we, each one of us is born with a weave. A, each, a weave? Each one of us is born with a weave. And this weave is like a picture. You know those pictures that you used to be able to fill in as a child which had numbers and each number was a color? Oh, yeah, yeah. So each one of us is born with a weave, like a picture around us that we need to color in. And every experience we have in life colors that picture and when the picture is done when the weave is completed and if you think of the medieval times when the women would spend their lives embroidering mm. so when our weave is completed we move on from this life we move on again and so we're born with this weave around us and this attracts what we need in our lives to grow through it attracts all that our soul has created and all the contracts that we've made with other souls and the contracts those souls have made with us hmm. to have these experiences in life. And our weave is just one thread on the weave of the earth for the earth herself has a great weave. And each one of us is just one thread on that huge great weave of the earth and so when we experience things when we go through situations the more cognitant we become the more conscious we become the more congruent with our nature we become the more we affect this huge weave of the earth and the more we feed into that weave and so living in the authenticity of our nature living in truth living in love living in harmlessness Harmlessness? Harmlessness, yes. Oh. We are actually feeding the great weave of the earth. And if you imagine that every single person is a thread on that earth, on that weave. So every single person on the earth is a thread on the weave. And as each person shifts and moves and colors the whole weave through their way of being, they are affecting every single other person on the earth. We're all interconnected. And so when I go through an experience and I grow accordingly, that affects everybody else in the world. And it gives them the opportunity to draw from that, to draw through that when they reach that point themselves. And so this is the greatest gift we can do. This is the greatest gift we can give our living earth. This is the greatest gift we can give our sisters and our brothers to live in the wholeness of our nature, to live all that I am, which is what's called I am that I am, living in the fullness of our nature. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> My mind has been blown. So this is a really, really interesting way of looking at life then. Um, and the way, I don't want to get political, but the way that current events are happening in the world now 
that's all working on this weave and yes, yes, changing it for the better. Yes. I hope. Yes, because you know, the more awake people are, the more they realize that they are responsible for their choices, and they are responsible for the choices made in their name. Ah, that's important. So if I find my local TD, my local like member of parliament, so to speak, uh -huh. um, doing things that are not what I would choose, I have the opportunity to go and see them. They have what's called clinics all year round in, in all the little towns and we can go and talk to them and we can say, I voted for you and you are doing this. And I do not like that. And I'm not going to vote for you next time. I'm going to tell my friends not to vote for you. If you think you can go out and kill deer all, around, all year round, then no, this isn't acceptable. So I have that choice. I have that opportunity to say what is not working for me. Because the more conscious you are, the more you have to take responsibility for your choices. And wow. the more you have to take responsibility for what other people do in your name. That's a fascinating concept. Yeah. A lot of things are done in our name. Yes. Um, and people like you say about the, you know, what's happening now politically, sure it's waking people up. It's waking people up. It's making people realize, yes, they have to vote. Yes, they should vote. And yes, they have a say in what's happening, not just in their country, but on this living planet. And so when situations arise, often that's to wake people up. Well, we're all waking up now. Yeah, what a blessing, <laughs> what a blessing. Because it's rare that a person can go back to sleep once they've woken up. Well, it's like we've all woken up from a nightmare. Yeah. Or woken that... into a nightmare. Oh, cheers, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The world is a weave. The world is a weave, and each one of us is a thread on that great weave. That's beautiful. Oh, wow. Take a moment with that. Hmm. So this is, this is amazing. So would, would you characterize um, all of this as shamanism, a form of shamanism, uh, I this way of the Siobhan? I would characterize it as ancient Irish teachings. Ah. Um, I grew up with my granny sharing some of these with me. I grew up with the stone people the tree brethren sharing this with me, spirit sharing it with me. And I've been working professionally in this sphere since I was 20. What have you been doing? So, um, well, first of all, of course, as I said, I saw spirit, you know, growing up mm -hmm. until the age of 12 when I had the eye operation for my double vision. Oh. And I stopped seeing spirit. And for the first time in my life, I started integrating into life. And I went to a convent school and I was very blessed that I was with lovely nuns. They were Vincent de Paul and they were the ones with the wings. Oh, like the flying nun show. Like the flying nun, I suppose. I have not seen that show myself. But I've just said how old I am. Uh, <laughs> saying well, I know that show. I'm even older, but <laughs> I don't know that show. Anyway, and uh, lovely women, lovely women. And they had uh, a home for the deaf and dumb. They had a home. I was in London at the time and they had a home for tramps, tramps? by Westminster Bridge, like the homeless, oh. and, um, and they had a, two orphanages. And I used to work with them at weekends. Oh, wow. Because they were just such good women. They taught me spirituality, which was a lovely thing. And, um, and then I went from there to another school, um, which was a mixed school, London Oratory, um, which was a mixed school, and I went there to do my exams. And that was quite hard to go into a school where of boys and girls oh. and where they didn't have good relationships with the teachers or the headmaster. And oh. I come from a lovely little school where we all got on quite well, you know. And, um, and during that time, at, in the class, the girls would often do in the convent school, they would do the Ouija board, the oh. back of the maths class. And in class, in school? Ah, yeah, ah, yeah, at the back, yeah. <laughs> the Ouija board in the back of class? teacher wasn't able to deal with them at all. <laughs> and, um, and because it was my subject, the one subject I loved, of course, I didn't want to do it, but it would only work if I had my finger on the glass, and then it would only work if I sat with it. And, it, of course, I kind of brought this with me to the next school as well. And, um, and then it would work 
if I was just in the room. If I wasn't in the room, it wouldn't work. And at the time, I believed in mind over matter. I'd become a real socialist at that point. Oh. And, um, and then um, I dragged a dear friend of mine, Margaret, uh, with me to see a clairvoyant. And she told me that I would be doing this work. Oh. And that kind of freaked me out for a while. And I slept at the bottom of Margaret's bed for a while for fear of being woken up in the middle of the night by spirits, you know. But of course it didn't happen that way for me. Um, and then I met a man, Owen Potts, who was very influential in getting me into a, what were called a development group at the time. Oh. I was 19 and through that the woman running it, Hilda, uh, realised that I didn't need to be in it. So she had me working within weeks in what's called spiritualist churches in England. Oh wow. Um, and so I would stand up and attune and ask spirit. And of course I'd be nervous as anything all day long, always worried that nothing would happen. But spirit never let me down. Wow. And, um, and so then I went from there gradually into uh, learning meditation, running meditation groups, and then getting into healing. And, um, and then in my late 20s, I uh, divorced my first husband. I had two children. And I was doing trance work, uh, which is a form of shape shifting. So I, that started when I was 22. Wow. So I would sit and open to spirit and they would come through me and talk through me. And I wouldn't remember. For me, it was like being in a beautiful white cloud. And um, so after I divorced my, uh, the next gentleman I met, my to-be second husband, realized that I wasn't doing anything with this except for giving readings. So he got me quite organized and doing it for groups and things like that. And at the same time, he was working with technologies that were environmentally friendly, ecologically enhancing to go into the third world. And so I started working with some of the scientists and technicians, and a lot of them were ex-NASA at the point at that point. NASA, like ex -NASA, the space? NASA, the space program, wow. yeah, because they started closing down their space program. And these people had been developing technologies that could work outside of our atmosphere. One man, Jerry, Jerry Humiston, actually uh, fabricated 63 pieces that were on the Earth, on the moon. Really? And so they had to work outside of their own knowledge. They had to extend their consciousness into the super consciousness to draw upon these technologies. So I began to work with them as well. How? And um, I would tune in to the technology. For example, the gypsum, um, a gypsum machine, which was huge, and it had five drums, and you could put uh, the powder in one end, and within minutes it would come out the other end. And it was a very, very fine powder, very, very light, and set in minutes we'd have to put um, lemon juice in it to slow the setting time and it had a balanced pH. What would it do? Well it, as a balanced pH. No I mean the, the, the gypsum thing. Well it changed the molecular structure of the powder and so each drum had certain blades and I was the one that went in and saw how the blades should be cut and how it made the powder implode on itself through the vibration and I was given a symbol for the sound so they drew the symbol they made the symbol on the end of plates to go at the end of each of the drums wait a minute so is this like a drill or something or whatever this is and you're psychically I, I go into the machine and I could see it I could go into the machine as the powder so they could turn it on and I could go in and see and I could see what needed to be done on the moon no, 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 this was here on the <laughs> earth. <laughs> but it, gypsum was a huge, is a huge problem. I don't know. We have mountains of gypsum as a byproduct from building things. Oh, I yeah, see. yeah. So psychically, you're psychically, I could in go in, these? yeah, yeah. And so we I've had a never vortex. Heard of this before. Yeah, we had a vortex grinder, and I could go in and see that. And so it was a fun time, and it was actually very, very good for me, confidence wise, because being dyslexic, I'd grown up hiding. And, um, and because I would talk from what I was seeing and feeling, I couldn't quote from books. And I couldn't say I went to this school or that school or, you know, I, I went to this esoteric school because that's not how it worked for me. For me, it was the stone people, it was spirit, you know, it was my granny. They were the ones giving me my teachings. I, 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 I can't. So you were working with NASA people and scientists as a psychic, yeah. having them... Yeah. 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 I never knew... Yeah. Were other psychics doing this? Is this a 
common thing. This I is don't amazing. Know. Oh, some of them was that's the thing. Some of them were so open to what I was doing and who I was. A lot of them, you know, were advocates of technologies from Tesla. I don't know if you've heard of yeah. Tesla, Wilhelm Tesla. And of course Tesla used to dream his technologies. He would see them in his dreams. So they understood that there was a greater consciousness than the consciousness that one talks about. And that in this greater consciousness, one could draw upon information. So you were doing this? For I was this? doing this with them. Yeah, for a while I did that. Yeah. yeah. I've never heard of such a thing. <laughs> Yeah. This is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. But it was very good for my confidence. Like I said, it really helped me to to really own myself. Yeah. Really own myself. Because when you grew up dyslexic, and in those days, they didn't know about dyslexia. So oh. you don't understand why you can't do what other people can do. You don't understand why you can't write like other people can write and spell and, and this sort of thing, you know. So you become very, very self-conscious. And I was self-conscious enough as a child. Yeah. So that impacted it even more so, you know. And then being with these people and them actually, you know, uh, working with me and being so delighted and then the technology's working. You know, it really brought my confidence up and, and uh, it brought me to that point of really accepting and honoring the way that I work. It almost seems like, you know, what would be labeled as a disability is actually um, an enhanced ability for you. All of yeah, yeah. all of this um, dyslexia and such is causing you to actually yeah. be able to have uh, enhanced abilities. Yes because I could see. Wow. I could see what they were talking about. If they could, if they knew what they were talking about, I could see it. I could see the picture of it. And when I saw the picture, I could begin to explain to them what I was seeing and they would draw it. And I'd say, no, no, not like this. It's like that. And so that's how we worked together. I would see it. <laughs> yeah. This is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what happened so after then, that? Yes, yeah, so then things changed as things do. I had another two babies and um, my ex started losing it. I was out of the office for about three years um, and we were living in community. And like a commune? No, not commune, a community. The difference is in a community, you stay with your own partner. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, very good. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and we had a community. We had a great big house that quite a few people lived in, and my oh. children, and, um, and then another couple that had a couple that had a baby. And then we had other people outside the community. So we had maybe four, six other people that the house couldn't take anymore. So they would just be there, but they lived in their own homes. And together we, we, we put all our finance and our focus into getting these technologies into the third world. And then my ex, during that time when I was not in the office and I was having the babies at home and I was do, still doing readings at home, um, he started losing it. He started not, not closing deals, not getting things finished, not getting things completed. And that really got worse rather than better. Oh. So when I went back, it was, um, it was a little chaotic. And so some of the people had gone off with the technologies and were implementing them, which was wonderful, but he wasn't closing the deals. And so it was time to move on. It was time to, you know, stop it because money was just running under oh, the table. Yeah. So, um, so that's what we did. And the community split up and I ended up moving back to Ireland with my younger two children. And before that, I'd started doing tours in Ireland of sacred sites, oh. which I absolutely loved and still love. So I've been doing those for nearly 24 years now and going to the ancient sites, sharing them with people, telling the stories, the myths and assisting people to move deeper into the earth, through the earth, doing ceremony together. And so it's something I all oh, I adore so much. So this is this has been your whole <clears throat> your whole life is Absolutely. just being part of of the land and yes. bringing it and now you you travel uh Sharing, sharing this. Uh, yes, absolutely. And so my whole adult life was in working with this, working with these energies, working as a clairvoyant, working, giving readings, doing healings, um, going on the pilgrimages. Uh, yeah. And now it's also teaching. It's teaching, helping people to find 
who they are through the teachings. Mm. Helping people to become more congruent with their nature, to become not just all, but even more than they are meant to be in this life. You're amazing. <laughs> this, is, this has been the fastest hour. I could, I could listen to you talk for hours and hours. <laughs> we're, we're soon to be out of time. Ah. So I was just wondering if there's any last, uh, last uh, information you wanted to get out. We got about uh, two, three minutes. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, should I look at the camera? Yeah, look right at the camera. Okay. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> For these last few minutes, I would like to say, listen to yourselves. Sit quietly for a few minutes each day and feel into who you are, feel into what you are, feel into what you're feeling, feel into where you're at in your lives. And if you don't like where you're at, give yourselves permission to change that. Give yourselves permission to dream yourselves into a better life for you. And when you do that, then ask, how do I begin it? How do I begin doing that? See the steps, one, two, three, and just do step one. Don't worry about step two and three, because when you take that one step, step two becomes step one. And when you take that step, step three becomes step one. But be honest with yourselves. Be honest with what's going on within you. Ask yourselves, am I happy? Is this feeding me? Am I being congruent with life around me? Walk in nature when you can. Hug trees, lie on the grass, breathe in the air, and know that you too are part of this living earth. Everything you think goes out into the world. Electron energies sending out and other people can feel that other people can pick up on that so how conscious can you become with what you're thinking to help the world to help the planet to help your community to help your family to help you how can you feed into the world through all that you think as well as what you do and what you say take responsibility of that learn that the nearest thing to God Goddess is joy, living in the joy of life. And find peace in that. Find that place of ease within yourselves. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> I'm so happy that you were on my show. Oh, thank this you. This was the greatest, <laughs> the greatest experience. Uh, Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, and thank you for watching this show. What a moving show this one was. Uh, Amantha Murphy, The Way of the Siobhan. Fantastic. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time for Time for Healing. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.